Hey friends, it's Sandra Clay. I'm the pastor at Cook Shine Methodist Church. And uh, it was a Monday on a Wednesday today, so thank you for your patience and for your flexibility. Uh, I'm hoping that a lot of you can find uh, this time uh, later on. Hey, Stacy, how are you today? Uh, thanks again for your patience, and I'm hoping that you guys can find some time uh, to be able to check in because uh, now the story is real. Whoops! Now the story is really getting kind of intriguing and weird and um, hard to understand at times. Uh, the story in Scripture, um, our story, God's story. Uh, so a couple of things really quick. Um, I did not respond yesterday because I'm still, I'm just not good at trying to watch and read and think and focus on the camera and all of that stuff. So you saw yesterday um, the plea for prayer for Kairos. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, the, um, the Emmaus uh, community or the experience of Walk to Emmaus, it's a three-day basic uh, spirituality course in Christianity um, uh, that you can experience uh, if you have questions about um, the Emmaus community or that experience have never heard about that let me know uh, if you're interested and I'll be glad to talk with you about it or send you some information but the walk to Emmaus uh, as I said is a three-day kind of basic primer in Christian spirituality. You're not going to learn much that you don't already know, but over those three days, because uh, you're asked to kind of come apart, uh, not come apart, apart, but to come apart from regular life, um, there is something about the experience of building community, um, talking with other women or other men, um, just like you, about the challenges of living the life of a disciple. Uh, it is a powerful experience. Highly, highly recommend it. I came from a Christian home that was very focused on building and serving the community, not just Christian community, but serving because of Christ. I know what it's like to be a part of a, Christ, uh, of a church family that was very uh, vital and active and loving, yet I can still say this is one of the primo experiences in my life of God's love and God's grace. Well, Kairos is the version of the walk to Emmaus that happens inside prison walls. There is this working relationship between warden and chaplain and the leadership of Kairos. They've all been through Emmaus. And so when you saw prayers uh, requested uh, from Kathy yesterday, this is a big, fat, hairy deal. And so it, whether you have any connection or not to that community, I invite you to be praying not only for the men and women who will be a part of that um, Kairos weekend, but those who will be serving them, but also the rest of those who are in prison the particular facility where Kairos will be held. I think this is the stinking coolest thing ever because you don't serve one without serving everybody. If you've never heard of Kairos cookies, you're gonna hear now, um, dozens of cookies are taken in to the prison. So even those men or women who are not approved to be a part of the Kairos weekend still receive that gift of homemade cookies from um, the Emmaus community. I think that is just, I mean, I can't say enough about it. So uh, again, if you have any questions about that, uh, send a little note, uh, type that in. Uh, and I'll be glad to answer any questions, but there's probably somebody here with us today that could answer them while we talk. So there we are. Good to see y'all. I also want to ask you uh, to be in prayer for our pr friend Cindy. You may have noticed that she's not uh, been on with us uh, regularly, not like she used to be. Uh, Cindy's kind of struggling, and so we pray for um, peace in her body peace in her mind, 
um, for the miraculous power of prayer to do its magic that she would know that not only does her God love her, but we love her too. Uh, and Cindy is not the only one who stands in need of that. So if you know of somebody, my friends, including yourself, that needs um, extra prayer, special prayer, I just would like to say that these folks who are gathering here and those who will watch this video later and add their own two cents, they are a trustworthy bunch. Your brothers and sisters uh, stand with you and uh, you can depend on them. So, uh, so good afternoon. Hey, Linda. Hey, I, so good to see everybody. All right, I'm uh, pretty uh, excited about this too and I'm gonna try to not like take your whole lunch hour for this. But um, if you notice, I typed in a little thing. This is about Balak, Balaam, Baal, and the girls. Is that intriguing enough for you? So, uh, hey, Cindy, how are you? Thanks for, uh, Cindy, um, uh, you'll see her it just popped on there right now. Cindy has been a part of Kairos for a long time. And so in my um, clumsiness, if I don't see a question, or something, Cindy's a good one to reach out to and ask her uh, for information about that. So um, thanks for letting me out you like that, uh, Cindy. I'm gonna, hang on just one second. My feet were cold, but now the rest of me is about to burn up, sorry. Um, forgive me. Okay, so here's what I want us to think about today is um, all of the great things that are happening uh, that uh, in Scripture. It begins on, it's my March 7th reading, so that's Numbers 22, and it runs through several chapters, but these are the things that are happening as God's people are nearing uh, the promised land, um, and there have been some uh, misbehaviors, shall we say, so some have been excluded uh, here. Um, we're going to, after this business of Balaam, we're going to hear a call for a second census to kind of see uh, how many folks are headed in. There's a reiteration of some of the stories, but I think this business of Balaam is the most interesting thing. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you about a little experience with this story in my life as I begin to kind of work out all the details of what I believed, um, what I was worried that God was calling me to. So let's get started. Um, so here's, we, we've been talking about where God was leading Moses and the Israelites. And so if you can imagine the Sinai Peninsula, remember I've told you they were coming kind of up that east side of the peninsula. Um, around uh, to where the sea uh, stopped. And instead of staying kind of that midline where the Red Sea, I mean the um, Salt Sea or the Dead Sea, and then the Sea of Galilee sit kind of on top of each other like those two little things with the Jordan in between, uh, the Mediterranean Sea would be to their west. Um, and then the east would be to the east. There you are. So um, they would have crossed uh, out of that peninsula and actually over towards the east a bit. And now you've got the plains of Moab as you begin to move a little bit north. That's where God's people are wandering uh, right now. Um, I will do my best to post a picture if I can figure out how to do that of uh, a map that I've been using that's a little bit easier to follow. But that's kind of where they are. So now they're kind of on the east side of the Dead Sea. Uh, and what happens is the Israelites are beginning to walk through the plains of Moab, and there's so many of them, boy, do they get noticed. So Balak, or Balak, who is uh, the king of Amor, is terrified because there's so many. You remember how Pharaoh noticed there's so many of them. What happens if they get ticked and rise up against us? You got that same kind of thought pattern here. It, um, what, I am, um, what I feel confident in saying is the way the world understands power is when you see someone 
who um, is uh, uh, greater than you in some respect. It's not far off if we're not confident in God's companionship and love that we begin to fear that we will be overpowered. And that's exactly where Balak or Balak is. And so he sends for Balaam. Now, here's the thing. Balaam has is going to have these conversations with God, and so it's easy for us to forget that Balaam is not a Hebrew. He's a foreigner too, and a bit of a spiritualist. He's a diviner, a diviner. And so I love that he shows this respect for and this um, cooperation with God Almighty. And they have this strange relationship. I want you to sit with that for a minute, my friends. Balaam is not a Hebrew who's been taught about the goodness and the immensity of God. He just trusts that there is this God and is willing to start from a place of respect even before he has a relationship with God. And look at how honest he is, how respectful he is toward God when he speaks with Balak or Balak. So uh, Balak sends messengers. Hey, uh, our boss wants you to come and curse these people so that he doesn't have to worry about them anymore. Uh, no, I can't do that. Uh, I, I can't do that. They went with money in hand, a fee for the divination process, uh, the spiritual stuff that Balaam was going to do. And he said, mm, you spend the night here to these messengers. You spend the night here. I'm going to go spend some time with God and see if he says anything to me about this. But I'll have to do what he says to do. Well, God comes to him God comes to him. This is, uh, we're reading in uh, chapter 21 now. Don't go with them. Uh, don't go with them. You must not put a curse on those people because they are blessed. So a second thing happens. Balaam goes back and, and said, no, I can't. I, I can't do that. They go back to Balak and say, Balaam refused to come with us. So he sends uh, more princes, more, uh, more distinguished representatives, and probably more stuff. Don't let anything keep you, Balak says. Don't let anything keep you. I, I will, I will re I'll make it worth your while if you'll just come, to, and I'll do whatever you say. Now, that is quite a, a check to write. Uh, come and put a curse on these people. And Balaam's response is, even if Balak gave me a palace filled with silver and gold, uh, I'm not going to do anything that goes beyond what God says I can do. You can stay here overnight, and I'll see if God says anything else to me. And God says, go with them, but only do what I tell you to do. This is where it gets a little uh, wonky. So, have y'all heard the story of the wonky donkey? That was a very poor reference to that. Uh, if you want to laugh, uh, go Google somewhere or you, you can YouTube it. Um, an Irish grandmother reading the story of the wonky donkey because this is a wonky donkey for sure right here. So, Balaam gets up and he goes. He still has in his mind that he is not going to do anything other than what God tells him to do. He's not promising to curse anybody, but he gets up and goes with these messengers and an angel of the Lord appears along the way. At first, it's in the middle of a wide stretch of road. The donkey can see the angel with a sword drawn. Balaam cannot. And the donkey veers against direction from Balaam over into a vineyard. And so Balaam 
uh, corrects the donkey, shall we say, in a pleasant way. He treated the donkey like he's never treated before and whipped him. Uh, it happens a second time. It's a little bit more narrow place now and these walls beside the vineyard are kind of closing in and when it tries to veer off the road, it can only go as far as the road and so the donkey crushed Balaam's ankle up or his foot up against the, the wall there and embarrassed him and frustrated him. He was telling the donkey to do one thing and it was refusing to do. Kind of donkeys do that. And he beat the donkey a second time. Third time, there is no way to turn. And so the donkey just laid down with Balaam on his back. I mean, hit his belly on the ground. And Balaam is furious and he beat the donkey. And God gave the donkey the ability to talk. And boy, did that donkey have some things to say. Um, I, uh, uh, let me start, uh right here. What have I done to you? The donkey says, what have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? Am I not your own donkey, which you have always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? You ought to be paying attention. You know this is not like my behavior. Why don't you ask what's going on? Why aren't you curious about what's going on instead of assuming you know everything, that you've got all you need to figure it out? Well, the donkey didn't say all that last part, but that's exactly what she meant whenever she said it. And the Lord finally opened Balaam's eyes. And so here in, um, this is 22. Uh, 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 34, because uh, God then says the same thing the donkey did. Why have or the angel does. Why have you beaten your donkey this way? I came here to oppose you, and the donkey was the one saving your skin. <laughs> yeah? So 34, Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. I did not realize you were standing on the road to oppose me. Now, if you are displeased, I will go back. That's the one thing without this relationship with God. You can re Balaam was respecting God and knew kind of in theory what a God may expect and how to be reverent in front of that God. God had already said once, don't go. You're not going to curse the people that are blessed. I, I, you're, 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 um, you're trusting what I'm going to say. You're not going to go against anything. I've already told you once they're blessed. And so the angel of the Lord says, no, go ahead and go. You keep on going. Y'all are already on the way. Keep on going. You just don't do anything outside of what God asks you to do. And isn't it funny? He finally gets to where Balak is. And Balak says, what took you so long? Basically, I promised you whatever you wanted. And here you are. And he says, but I'm here now. Balaam says to Balak, I'm here now, but I'm not going to do. He makes it very clear again. I'm not going to do anything outside of the purpose of God. Balaam and Balak begin this uh, three-time series of building, offer, uh, uh, building altars and making offerings. Not uncommon um, in all of the world of sacrifice and uh, worship offered to idols or other gods. There wasn't anything strange or odd about the offering of an ox or a goat. It was how that offering was made and why that offering was made. And Balak cannot hear. He refuses to receive that Balaam is not going to curse for him a people that have already been blessed by this God again and again and again. We can see over these three different times that Balak is wanting his own power to be assured and um, solidified. And, and really what he's doing, not just with Balaam, but with God through Balaam is manipulative, 
It is to leverage influence. It is to purchase or mishandle power and relationship. And what is it that happens? Over three times, Balaam gets to see the love that God has for the people Israel. Again, to the point that finally, Balaam cannot offer anything but a blessing. And it is really rubbing Balak raw. I brought you here for one purpose. And ba Balaam had already told him again and again and again, I'm not going to do anything outside of God, what God wants me to do. I'm not, just because you've got the power and the money and the influence and you're good at manipulation, the world does not understand power the way our God understands power. Balak's anger burned against Balaam. He struck his hands together and said, I summoned you for a reason. Now leave and go home. I would have given you uh, a great reward, but the Lord has kept you from being rewarded. Balaam already knows that his reward at least is obedience. Isn't it strange how a stranger to this faith that God is inspiring in his people Israel, he is a stranger to covenant relationship with this God, but he understands it better than most of them. Uh, I'm not I'm not worried about not getting a reward from you. I can go home with the stuff I came with. And I told you already, but that's not all Balaam has to say. Balaam tells Balak about what's going to happen to him. What's going to happen to the people all around him. Balak wants him to keep looking at the Israelites, just a part of them. And they were such a massive crowd. It was amazing to take that in. And Balaam told him exactly what God had to say about it. He went his own way and Balak went his own way. And what was uh, spoken of, the oracles they're called, that Balaam confessed came to pass. And it was not good for those who were there. Now I promise you one day soon, because of the battles and the conquering, we're going to talk about why so much bloodshed and why these indigenous people, um, it seems that God was pleased that the Israelites killed them off. Uh, why death so important? But I do want to make a couple of comments here at the close because it's not long after all of this. They're in uh, foreign territory now. They're in the Moabite plains. And because these people began, the Israelite people, began to interact with the Moabite people, it wasn't long before uh, fraternization, celebration, building relationships, or just having a good time making friends led to the, um, the worshiping of Baal of Peor. But Baal was a foreign god. It, maybe the Israelites didn't take seriously what they were doing, offering themselves in worship because they were just trying to get along with neighbors or to meet the new girl down the street. But what happened is they sacrificed their loyalty their single-mindedness of God for the sake of getting along. And they were immoral with these people whose influence led them astray. Balaam was an, uh, a better example of fortitude and loyalty to God Almighty than some of the Israelites were. 
And the call then was to deal with all of that. Phineas, Phineas is the son of Eleazar. Eleazar is the son of Aaron, who's taken over the high priest role, do you remember, not too long ago? And Phineas is the one who zealously does something that we would think horrible, and that is he witnessed an Israelite even after hearing God's displeasure at their rebellion. He um, addressed, shall we say, a man who took um, a, a woman into his home for them to have relations um, and saw it as an act of worship or attention to Baal. And, um, and God was upset. But Phineas took care of it and God rewarded his zeal. How many other people had seen the same thing happening and were afraid to say anything, forgot to say anything, also didn't realize that fraternization sometimes are not taking seriously what God has asked of us will lead to our fall. It happened so quickly and so easily. And so I want you to see Baal, uh, ba Balaam as um, a better example of learning in our relationship with God than though our own ancestors have been. To respect and revere what it is that God is able to do and that God will speak to us. That God, with, Balaam took time aside to listen for God. And then whatever God said, he enacted. You've got Israelites who have been delivered through, from slavery through the wilderness now, have been fed literally and figuratively, and they forgot. We also see in this second census not only, or in this time where the second census was called for, uh, a continuation of God uh, calling out or using women in a way that often a patriarchal society would never point to. It's one thing for us to read in the census um, about the numbers. Yeah, they're counting only the men. They're, they're only counting the men. But watch this. Uh, and this is in Numbers 25, when they uh, the census is looking at the descendants of Manasseh. That's one of Joseph's boys. Manasseh uh, included um, uh, uh, a descendant named Zelophehad. Zelophehad only had daughters. Scripture records Zelophehad's daughters, and there's going to be another reference soon because Zelophehad died in the wilderness before they crossed into the promised land. And normally, normally, it would have been the son who inherited the inheritance that would have gone to Zelophehad, and they petitioned, these girls did, to be able to reserve receive what their father deserved and it was granted we'll talk more about their um, about their uh, whole ordeal a little bit later and then finally I want you to uh, part of the first chronicles passage that helps us understand the uh, descendants of Ephraim another child of Joseph listen to this this is first chronicles 7 verse 24. It's actually um, in reference to uh, Ephraim's descendant named Beriah, B-E-R-I-A-H. Uh, there had been misfortune in his family, uh, in the family, and they had uh, this son late in life. His daughter was Shira, who built lower and upper Beth Horon as well as Uzan Shira. If not careful, friends, we read right past 
some of those details about the amazing things outside of what you would expect a God to do. But our God is like no other God. My friends, it is time for us to be aware of this. Sometimes it is the people outside the people of God who know and respect and revere the power of God greater than we do. We like running our mouths about it, singing about it, doing things the way we've always done them about it, but we forget and get too familiar with this one who is the God of all and forget to be in all, to be reverent, to trust what God says, to be uh, fearful, reverently fearful, and to take seriously what our rebellion or disobedience, ignorance or neglect might mean. First for our relationship with God and then for those who would be impacted for generation after generation after generation. Here's the little story that I wanted to tell you. When I was in, uh, started seminary, that was my first uh, experience with Christian education outside of Sunday school and Bible studies in a local church. Um, and I thought that this whole thing, that it was uh, on a devastating path toward hell and somebody else was holding the basket. I mean, we, we were headed there. But I learned that so many things that I presupposed about Scripture were not true. But coming to seminary and opening myself up um, to so many of the new things about God's working and God's doing and God's loving and God's grace... Uh, this study, this process of study, gave me pause to not be ashamed of what I don't know yet, but to keep pressing toward understanding and learning. I had somebody come in while we were studying for an Old Testament exam and heard that we were talking about Balaam and Balak. You know that God used that passage, this um, co, uh, student, fellow student said, God used that passage to teach me about the role of women in the life of the church. Hmm, that was my response. Another person from the same annual conference, same um, kind of circle of friends, clergy friends, was mortified and so upset in her mind, it was as if that person had called the both of us donkeys because uh, we were thinking, man, if God can use a donkey, God can use anything, anyone. And we were likening men and women and donkeys. My friends, that is not true, but I do want this lesson to be highlighted today. Let's not lose sight that God can and will use anyone any experience, any circumstance, any moment, any body to accomplish what is divine and what is the will of God, whether we cooperate or not. I, I rather like the idea of a Balaam who uh, is so open-minded uh, that they see with fresh eyes, the power and grace of this one who loves us like no other. May we always remember, Balaam ain't a bad guy because he don't know God. Balaam experienced God more closely than some of those who love to spout his name. Maybe, may we learn to trust and to revere the power of God, may we draw close to God as quickly as Balaam did. And may we, may we celebrate that power at work, even within each of us. Let's pray. Lord, I'm so grateful for this um, really wonky story of a donkey that can, that can talk and only talks because... Uh, 
his master doesn't understand that he too is responding to the power of God. I thank you for Balaam for this reason too, because I forget that there are people around me who understand grace and love. They understand mercy and purpose, even when they don't understand this one whom I call God. And we can learn from each other. Help us learn, O oh God. And we thank you for your willingness to love us, to teach us how to serve, and to remind us of your infinite power. Bless our friends. Bless my friends. Bless us all that we might be strong as we follow you. In the name of Christ, we pray this day. Amen. My friends, we'll close up the week tomorrow. I pray between now and then you know joy immeasurable and peace to your core. See you soon. Bye.